Well, welcome to English 1120, um, our introduction to grammar course here at Southern Utah University. And the purpose of this video is to explain structure class words. So we will try to define what structure class words are, and then we'll talk about eight different categories of structure class words and give some examples of each. The goal here is not for you to memorize everything about these, but just as an introduction, and you'll be start to become more familiar with them the more we work with sentence types throughout the semester. So what are structure class words? Well, we've already talked about form class words. That form class words have the majority of the lexical meaning of a sentence. In other words, uh, a form class word we can more easily identify with an object or an idea, whereas structure class words have more of the grammatical or the functional meaning. Um, in sentences. So in other words, structure class words tell us about relationships between words. Let's look at an example sentence here. So the Brisey Trinklement was glipsing mondily through the adnucted tibution. What is this? But I want you to take a moment and think about this. Imagine in your mind this breezy trinklement. What is the dr breezy trinklement doing? It's glimpsing mondily through the abnected tubition. Okay. Now, sure enough, you've realized these are not English words, um, but all of these made up words are our form class words. So our nouns, we can see we've got a couple nouns in green. We've got a couple adjectives in yellow. We've got a verb uh, in the present participle in the blue, and we even have an adverb in sort of the reddish pink. And they've got the features, they would actually probably pass our, our proofs for uh, form words, right? We can see they've got some of the morphemes you would expect in nouns, the meant or the shun. We've got some ones that we might expect of the verbs and the adverbs. Um, but we don't really know what these mean. But the sentence, you could imagine in your mind, if you imagined what the breezy trinklement was, you would know that it was glimpsing mondily. If you imagine in your mind what that verb means to glimpse and how would you do it? You do it mondily, whatever mondily means. And then it goes through the abnucted tibution. So we don't know what these form class words mean, but we understand how they're working together to tell this story of the sentence. Contrast this with this sentence, okay? Instead here, now we've replaced all of the function words or the structure words in the sentence with nonsense words. Gleese honorable villager Nicked house, volunteers revealed, a boolean scavel rejected soon. So all our form class words are real English words. We can, we all have a shared idea of what an honorable villager is and what volunteers revealed means and what rejected soon also means. But we have no idea how these words relate to one another because our structure class words are nonsense words. We don't know where are the determiners, the prepositions, conjunctions, any of that. It's just gone. We can't make a guess here. Uh, we would all have a different idea about how the honorable villagers and the volunteers on this rejection are all taking place. Who's doing what? We don't know because the structure class words are gone. And so this is the goal of, of structure class words in a sentence. They tell us the relationships of how these words relate to one another and how they work together to give the meaning of the sentence. All right. So let's talk about another difference between our form class words and our structure class words. Form class words that we've already talked about can undergo lots of morphological change. We can add inflections, we can add word parts to them, prefixes, suffixes, we can change them. And they do that a lot. And there's a huge variety of these words. You want an adjective to describe a person? There's lots of adjectives. You want verbs to describe what the person does? There's lots of different verbs. Even to describe similar actions, we have many different verbs. Structure class words, on the other hand, do not change. Okay? We don't inflect these generally. Um, and there's a very narrow variety of these words in English. That said, the structure class words we have get used a lot over and over and over again in English because we don't have much variety. We have to use the ones we have a lot. In fact, the 20 most frequent words in English are all uh, structure class words. Look at all of these. We've got articles, we've got conjunctions, we've got um, some helper verbs, pronouns, um, prepositions. In fact, on most lists of frequent words in English, you have to get 
past the 50 most common words before you even get to a form class word. Because structure class words are a narrow group of words, but we use them all the time, over and over and over again. They're the most important words sometimes to learn when you're learning English uh, as a beginner, is you have to learn these words because they appear so frequently in our speech and our writing. So let's talk about some different categories. Determiners. This might be a new wor word for you, um, but really determiners includes things like articles, and articles is not new to you. Um, so determiners appear before nouns, but they're not adjectives. In fact, if we were to put them under those adjective tests or those proofs that we talked about last week, they'd fail almost every single one of them. So determiners include things like articles. We talked about a and the. Also demonstrative determiners like this, these, those, that. Possessives, mine, your, their, okay. Uh, indefinites, some or all, are all cardinal numbers, any number you can think of, okay. Ordinal numbers like first and second, okay. And then quantifiers, things like tripling or halfing or a quarter. The next category is auxiliaries. So auxiliaries are primarily helper verbs. They appear before verbs, uh, but they don't contain the main meaning of the verb. That's what the main verb does. Here, they're here to help the verb. They usually tell us about the mood or the, the tense or the aspect of the verb. So we have modals as one category. Modals are words that like can, should, will, must, may, okay, might. Um, they cannot be inflected. So we don't change them depending on whether they're past or third person. We don't do that with modals. We'll talk more about them later. And then we have three other helper verbs um, that have serve special functions in English. So have helps with the perfect aspect, um, whether it's the present perfect or the past perfect. So here's an example sentence, I had eaten. That's past perfect, okay? And the have is helping us know that this is an action that took place further in the past than some other action. Then we have the be, which serves the progressive or sometimes it's called the continuous aspect. This is the ing form, right? It builds present participles that we've talked about. Um, I was or I am eating. I was eating as the past progressive. Uh, I am eating as the present progressive. Then we have the verb do, okay? Which we use for inversion, negation, proverbs, emphasis. Do I eat, right? Um, I do not eat. Um, I do. Someone asks, do you eat? And you say, I do, right? Do is here acting proverbially, meaning it's taking the place of the verb eat. Or sometimes we use do also to give emphasis to a sentence, I do eat. So we're emphasizing the positive, the affirmative here. And again, we'll talk about more about this later, but just keep in mind that have, be, and do are different um, when they're used as an auxiliary than they are when they're the main verb. When they're the main verb, they have different meanings. Have means to possess, be means um, the state of being, okay? And do um, has to do with actions. Then we have a group called qualifiers. Qualifiers increase or decrease things. Sometimes they're mistaken for adverbs, but if we put them against those proofs, they would fail those tests. You can't use more or most with them. There's no syntactic flexibility with adverbs. Adverbs, you can move them around in the sentence, but with qualifiers, you can't. So we have single word ones like very, quite, really, it's pretty good, okay, it's just right. And then we have ones that form phrases like uh, a bit tired or sort of lazy. Pronouns is another category and pronouns take the place of a noun or a noun phrase. So for example, she left the umbrella with the green handle on the table. That entire phrase, the umbrella with the green handle, could be replaced by a pronoun, in this case, it. And there's just a very limited number of pronouns in English. Right? We don't have lots of them. We have a, a small number and we just reuse them a lot. Uh, we have personal pronouns like they and them. We have differences there, whether it's the subject or the object, right? Versus I and me, object and subject difference. We have reflexive pronouns like itself or herself. Um, and we use reflexive pronouns when we want to talk about the person doing the action is doing the action to themselves, so that antecedent matches the action. Sometimes we also use them in English to add emphasis, like, you know, for myself, I'll do this. Okay. Not that I'm doing it for myself, but I'm trying to emphasize that I really want to do this. I myself will do this. We have reciprocal ones like um, each, um, they spoke to each other, okay, or they spoke to one another. 
when we have some indefinite ones like somebody or no one or another. Uh, we also sometimes use you and they as indefinite. For example, well, they say it's going to rain. We don't know who they is, right? Maybe they is replacing this idea of they like the weather forecasters or something, but we do the same thing with you, right? Uh, you know, uh, you really don't want to do that. I'm not talking to you specifically, but I'm just talking about a person in general. And sometimes we use you to do that. Okay, then let's talk about prepositions, another category. A good way to think about prepositions is that they occur prepositioned to noun phrases and sentences. Um, and so they're different from adverbs. For example, I'm eating inside. Inside here is acting as an adverb. It's, it's describing where the eating is happening. Um, but I'm eating inside the tent. Now it's introducing this noun phrase, right? The tent. And so first inside functions like an adverb. The second inside here is functioning as a preposition because it is introducing this noun phrase. Um, prepositions also should be distinct from phrasal verb particles. A phrasal verb is a verb that has two parts to it, two words. And we'll take a look at an example here. So we have, I'm going to turn right. Now, right is functioning as an adverb. It's telling the direction or how I'm turning. I'm going to turn in a circle. Okay, now in is functioning as a preposition, okay, because it's, it's introducing this noun phrase, a circle, I'm turning in a circle. And then we have one here, I'm going to turn in. But in here is not functioning as a preposition. Instead, it's a particle of this phrasal verb. To turn in has a special meaning, right? To turn in means I'm going to go to sleep. And so it's not functioning as a preposition. Um, it's just this particle, it's a special part of uh, a verb phrase. Let's talk about the category of conjunctions. You're probably already familiar with a lot of these. Essentially, conjunctions work as grammatical joiners, bringing parts together. So we have the coordinating conjunctions you probably learned in school. You may have heard the acronym FANBOYS, the most famous uh, way to remember uh, coordinating conjunctions for and uh, nor, but, or, yet, so. Um, and they just bring two equal sized things together. That's why they're called coordinating. We have something called conjunctive adverbs or a special type of adverb, uh, and they just sort of help signal relationships. Um, we're not necessarily a joiner, but they do lend an information to what maybe was spoken previously um, in, an, in a longer utterance. And then they usually start um, a new sentence. We'll look at some examples. But because they're an adverb, you can often move them around in the sentence. They don't always have to be at the front or the end. And then we have subordinating. Um, should say subordinating conjunctions, sorry. <laughs> and uh, they bring together parts that are not equal. Whereas coordinating conjunctions are equal, subordinating conjunctions now create a dependent clause that needs to be attached to another one. It can't exist on its own. And again, we will look at lots of examples of these throughout the semester. We're just trying to introduce some terms here. So let's look at punctuation, how they're punctuated. A coordinating conjunction uses a comma before the coordinating conjunction and the equal sized unit that you're adding. So if you're at bringing two sentences together, I will drive, he will navigate, you put a comma after the first one, put and for that coordinating conjunction and then the second one. Okay. And that's considered a complete sentence, even though it's got two sentences, that coordinating conjunction lets you put two sentences together without turning it into a um, pronoun sentence. Then we have conjunctive adverbs. Again, we talked about how these are um, a type of adverb and as we know, adverbs can be moved around in a sentence at the beginning, at the end, sometimes in the middle. Um, and so the goal is with a conjunctive adverb, just offset it from the main phrase with the commas. Um, so if you put it at the beginning, you just need a comma after it. If you put it at the end, you only need a comma right before it. If you put it in the middle, put a comma before and after. And then with our subordinating conjunctions, I made it that, that error there, um, use a comma if the subordinating clause is the first clause in the sentence. If it's the second one, you don't need a comma before the subordinating conjunction because that word itself will signal the difference. So here's this example. While is our coordinating conjunction. While they sang, comma, I read a book. Now you could flip it around. You could say, I read a book while they sang. And then you don't need that comma um, because the while is working to signal um, that dependency. Okay, just a couple last categories, relatives. Okay, these signal a modifying phrase. We have pronominal ones like who, whom, whose, which, that. So we, for example, a sentence might be, um, 
the door that is broken um, uh, needs to be fixed. Uh, and then we have adverbial ones. These uh, function in an adverb sense uh, to answer things like when, where, and why. Interrogatives are very close to this. Uh, we have some of the same words, in fact, with interrogatives. But the difference between relatives and interrogatives is interrogatives are just used to answer questions, direct questions or indirect questions. They take the place of the thing that needs to be answered in the question. So here's a direct question. Who is at the door? Someone is at the door. Right? And so we place someone with the who. And we say, who was at the door? Or she wondered who was at the door. Right? Um, and this is an indirect question. So she wondered something. Okay? What she wondered is who is at the door or someone is at the door. And so we use this interrogative to replace that and the who functions in that way. And we'll look at lots of examples of this and we'll learn how to better dissect and understand how all of these different function words work in sentences as we go throughout the semester. So this is a bit of a fire hose approach. We learned a lot of new words and examples. Don't feel like you've got to memorize it all. You just want to start getting comfortable with some of these new ideas. So we talked about what are structure class words. We went over eight different categories of them and some examples of each. And hopefully this is starting to help you feel a little more comfortable with some of these new words. You can go back and rewatch the video or take a look at the readings where you can get more detail. But don't feel like you've got to memorize everything right away. We're going to get lots of practice with this.